to all my publishing friends, this is the show to listen to. I am so excited about this guest. As a matter of fact, he'll probably start laughing. I sent him more than one set of questions because I had so many questions I want him to answer that I sent him two interview briefs of different questions. I'm so excited because today I'm going to be speaking with Tony Napoleone. He is the VP of Client Services at Omida. And why Tony is so interesting is because he has worked with a publishing audit company. He has worked at a publisher, a B2B publisher, and now he is at Omida with the technology side. So you see, he is going to give us insights into all of that. But before we get started, my name is Donna Peterson, and you are listening to the B2B Marketing Excellence Podcast. I go around the world talking with business leaders, marketing executives about their industry, what's working, what's not, so that they can help us navigate this sea of information to achieving our goals. Hi, Tony. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank, thanks for having me. That is that is quite the introduction. Um, so I'm one. I'm already now. I got very nervous hearing all of that. And I guess as as further proof um, that we did not rehearse this or that it is off the cuff. You went for it with my last name, which you know you can tell with me talking with my hands. I, I really appreciate it. It's as simple as Napoleon. It's the e at the end that kills absolutely everybody. But I I like the way you said it, so we can stick with that. Oh, come on. I like Napoleone. I think that sounds it's, like I'm going to be sitting down to a nice pasta meal with you after we it's, finish. It's a lot more fun. My ancestors would be a lot happier with you than they are with me. So <laughs> thank and you for my, having me. This, this is going to be a lot of fun. My my husband's last name is Pesci. You know, my kids go by Pesci, but the problem is no one says it properly. We're always pushy party or the fishy party or whatever it is. But <laughs> so I get the last name. So sorry about that. Not saying Not it correctly. Problem. But like I said, I was so excited that you agreed to come on the show because you give an insight to publishers like none of the guests I've had before because of your work experience. And I'm wondering, being with BPA Audit and then being at Bobbit and now being at Omida, how has that experience improved how you help clients with the Omida platform? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that's a great way to start. I mean, one, it uh, it definitely gives you a crash course kind of in all the different ins and outs of the industry as a whole. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the, the space for coming up on 20 years at this point, and obviously there's been a, a ton of, of evolution within the space, right? So I think on the audit side of things, that was a nice way to kind of get started and see the, the backbone of the industry and, and understand uh, a lot of those operational needs, exposure to a lot of, at that point, they were just mostly uh, fulfillment companies, that sort of thing. But uh, certainly my experience uh, with Bob and Business Media on the West Coast was was really transformative just because they had so many different types of brands. They were in so many different markets. It was a great organization to work for. Um, I was lucky enough to have some really great mentors throughout my time there um, who really allowed me to go in a lot of different directions. So what started as a more traditional circulation fulfillment route quickly evolved into everything from from SEO to web analytics to social media to email acquisition strategies, event marketing, and, and kind of everything you could think of uh, on that front. So uh, when the time came, uh, when the opportunity arose to uh, come over to Omida about six years ago, uh, I, I really viewed it as a great chance to take those those 10 plus years with Bobbit and turn that into a, a more scalable kind of solution from the Omida perspective to say, okay, what, how does that voice of the customer sit within the Omida organization, since we obviously had our own uh, uh, aggressive growth plans as well? Right. Well, and yes, I would think looking at the technology side, now you come to Omida and you say, you know what really would be great because you wanted that at your previous job. You wanted Absolutely. to grow your audience. So now you're like, guys, can we do this? Yes, for sure. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun to buy marketing technology. And I, I certainly bought my share over my 10 years uh, with Bobbit. So was lucky enough to, uh, to get to try out a lot of different fulfillment companies, a lot of different email platforms, different CDPs, and then all the, all the different 
$10 a month, uh, like pop-up makers and form builders that you can imagine. So really getting to see both the, the enterprise side of the equation, as well as those much smaller point solutions um, that really exposed, uh, I think, the opportunity that, that existed within the, uh, the publishing and media space. And what is needed, because right now, I think there's over 9,000 different types of marketing technology we could all look at. And it does get overwhelming. I know for myself, like you said, I've subscribed to this or I've signed up for this subscription. And then I'm realizing I don't even use that or it doesn't integrate well with everything else I'm using. And this is now, um, but I just noticed like Omida, you're doing a lot of integration with other types of software, which is going to really help publishers know that audience and understanding who they are, which I Absolutely. think- Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And I, sorry to, to step on no. you there. I think we, we all love that infographic of, of the 9,000. Uh, it's definitely a, a favorite slide of marketers to, uh, to drop into slide desk, uh, desk. I know I was- I used it a ton of times just trying to emphasize that point of how much stuff is out there when I was still on the operator side of things. Uh, and now I'm one of the I'm one of 9000 guilty parties, obviously, in that space, too. And I, I think to my uh, to what I said earlier, it's it's a lot of fun to buy technology. Right. Like we, we love to think as marketers that we're one tool away from success. Oh, if I only had this little feature or bell or whistle or something like that, I think we're also starting to see a bit of a buy versus build or continuing to see a buy versus build struggle uh, within the space where these media and publishing companies are trying to decide like if they want to be publishers or if they want to be technology providers and where their own internal development teams fit into to all of that. But I think the, the technical debt aspect is very real. I think those overstuffed uh, technology stacks will slow you down. I think there's a privacy and compliance struggle with all of that. So that's why, to to your point, I think getting into a specific vertical is, is going to be important for, for a variety of reasons. And also when you can get all that information in one place, it really helps you know and understand your audience, but it helps you streamline a lot of the processes you have in-house and I know working with some of my clients on the Omida platform, it is great if we have all the forms in one place with Omida, or we have everything, all the emails that they do within Omida, because now this is helping us get some insights on how we can flip some of those unknown visitors to know. Absolutely. And that's one of the key talking points, I would say, within the space right now, I think, and, and we can spend time talking about privacy and compliance. If you want, we can go down a bunch of different directions, but the the concept of unknown to known is definitely like top of mind for everybody. Everyone's looking for strategies. Everyone's looking for best practices. And it, it kind of comes, it, it comes across as a cliche, but it really comes back to that age old, right people at the right time with the right message with, with all of that. So, you know, unpacking that a little bit, the right people, I think going after those repeat uh, visitors or that surge audience, making sure you're taking advantage of that first party audience data to understand, okay, who are the actual people? Instead of just saying, great, I have 10,000 unknown people on my site every week. They should all be newsletter subscribers. You know, that's not true. You know, you're going to get a lot of referral traffic, search traffic that may not necessarily be your, your target audience with all of this. I think the timing aspect is really key. Uh, we, we always advise our clients, don't hit these folks right on their first visit, right, yeah. at, you know, right as they come in the first time or at the wrong point in their journey. I think giving them the right message to avoiding that, like, hey, get, sign up here and get the latest news and best practices. Like, that's yeah. certainly what everybody says. Um, so I think using that first party data that you already have allows you to create that much more compelling offer and saying, okay, great. We know Donna's coming back to the Omita site at least once a week and she keeps reading about email providers. Okay, how do we give her the, here's a white paper on the best 10 things you should consider when you're when you're investing in an email platform or something like that, instead yeah. of me just pounding you with like the industry newsletter. Now, again, depends on how niche your vertical is with some of this stuff. I think if you're super niched, you can kind of really go in and start to say, okay, they're only here if they're definitely part of our, our okay. ICP. But the broader you are, the more deliberate you have to be with, with all of that. Right. But I still think you can always whittle it down and give the people 
exactly what they want and if they see that you're offering them this special information. For instance, I work with a very specific niche publisher and yes, their publication is specific niche, but then we have newsletters that are for specific industries. And what we've been doing is we monitor, are they coming to the website? Are they going to most of our automotive pages or medical page or energy? And then they only get information about the newsletters that are pertaining to that specific industry. And of course, then they sign up because they say, all right, you're already in the specific niche, but now you're talking about just within the automotive industry. Like you said, it's, it's a no brainer. They need it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those, if you're an e-commerce site, don't offer running shoes to the person reading about vacuum cleaners. Yeah. Absolutely makes sense. And I, I think especially for B2B publishers, there's yeah. so much great, rich taxonomy coming across from your content management system mm -hmm. that should be feeding into your customer data platform where you know what they're reading about, whether yes. it's a topic, whether it's a category, whether it's even a specific advertiser. Again, you want to come up with something that's going to scale um, for your own business. But I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that's out there. Um, and even just taking a much smaller um, subsection of your audience, saying, here are the engaged people, and applying oh. even a conservative um, uh, conversion number, you know, you might pick up 20, 30, 50 new people per week or per month. Yeah. Those are that that's at no additional cost, right? You're already yes. paying for all of that within your existing yeah. tech stack, as opposed to the cost of going out and just buying a net new name and kind of taking your chances with some of that. There's still a place for that sort of, you know, third party outreach. But if you already have these folks, uh, you know, right on your website, you got to take advantage of that. Because I think the, the days of having one key source that's going to drive 90% of your new name conversions, that that has just been gone for for quite a long time yes. at this point. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, back in the day, it was big, okay, let's do this big promotion. You get all these sales and it, it doesn't work like that. And I think, you know, we do a lot on helping people get those external email lists or banner positions, but that has to be complemented with a strong platform in-house for your in-house database visitors to your website. And I look at these platforms, I always tell clients, it's as if you have another employee that's working 24 seven, 365 days a year. And when people start, it's funny, that always seems to be a clicking point with my clients because they're like, wow, if you think about it that way, it's not that expensive. <laughs> 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 no, that's a good point. I've, I've never heard it put like that before, but I, I think that's, yeah, that, that's a great way to look at it. And it's a great yeah. resource that you have right at, right at your fingertips. Absolutely. And I think with everybody, time and attention is, is one of their most valuable assets, resources, however you want to refer to it. So asking them, oh, just sign up for one more newsletter. I mean, we're all so tired of saying it, yes. but our inboxes are overloaded, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff you always hear from. So you have to give them a compelling reason to actually jump in because I may be super interested in what's going on in the media and publishing space, but if I'm already getting four newsletters about it, I, I just reached overload on that. And so it almost becomes more of a like last in, first out or one in, one out, however you want to look at it with some of this too and say, okay, like show me that this one is more, more valuable than the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, with marketing different sources, I, they just all regurgitate the same material over and over. And so after a while, I just unsubscribe because I don't need to see it six times. Right. But if someone, yeah, yeah. yeah, but if someone sends a message that is really directed towards me, one, they could be directing it towards as a business owner, or they could be directing it as a marketing consultant or agency, but then they put the twist and they know that I'm very industrial or industry specific. That perks me, you know, that that's like, mm -hmm. okay, wait a minute. We got to pay attention because how you market those sort of things is totally different than just, you know, maybe a B2C promotion. We're not selling a pair of shoes here. You know, <laughs> yeah, any sort of original content is always going to be key. That's always going to be super helpful, especially, I mean, and really for our own purposes, we see that our, our top converting um, uh, pieces of content are all original research, uh, research, original content, industry benchmarks. That's the stuff that just really resonates within within our space. Um, and so we lean into that. We're always looking around saying, what else can we produce that would be this kind of helpful? You don't need Omita going out there and just being an additional news aggregator because right. there are already lots of other 
frankly, much bigger companies that report on that sort of thing that have journalists out in the field. And, you know, we so we want to stay in our lane to that extent. Yeah, talking about the Omita platform and what types of results you see within the platform really helps publishers. And this comes back to one of these words you said, anytime someone says engaged, I get very excited because when I went to your Omita conference in May, Years ago, you know how it was. Publishers just wanted large subscriber numbers. They just wanted large subscriptions. And as a company that goes out and looks for banner options or subscriber lists from different publishers, I don't want large numbers. I'm looking for quality of numbers. And that's when that engaged word is like a ding. <laughs> You know, when I heard all these publishers that were trying different things like Annex and CFE, you know, talking about what they do to make sure that their subscribers are engaged, those are the sources I want to recommend to my clients. And I love that, that you're talking about engaged. And that's how Omida, looking at what they're looking at, you're able to keep the subscribers engaged with content they want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think both Annex and CFE, to, to your point, have, have really made a great business out of yeah. focusing on that part of their audience. I think it's it's always going to be a bit of a struggle. You're, you're always going to have individual advertisers, individual salespeople who want to sell based on CPM. So the lower the volume, that takes money off the IO. And obviously, yeah. that's not what anybody wants with something like this. But the clients who are seeing the most success are really pushing that engaged concept. They are helping their advertisers uh, and their and their partners understand the larger funnel of yeah. what's going on through those those different purchase paths and helping them align the right content with the right type of people through those um, uh, through those different programs. So yeah, I think that's where you have an opportunity as a publisher to make sure your individual salespeople are educated about this and are there then pushing that information to their advertisers directly. Because listen, all of our clients' advertisers want to become publishers or at least act like publishers themselves, right? This is nothing new. This is what they've been doing for a number of years at this point, but that's why we see some of our clients, advertisers buying HubSpot, in some cases using Omita uh, and kind of going through and saying, hey, we need to develop our own original content. We should really own our first party audience. So frankly, for our, for our direct clients, it's an opportunity to partner with them even more because finally, those those goals and the, those ambitions are aligning a lot more closely than they used to when you had a publisher who yeah. just wanted a really targeted list and, and an advertiser who said, I just want a million impressions. I don't care where they come from. You can you can drop me on like the bottom, like like right eight, uh, 300 by 250 down, in the corner. Down here, down, down, down. <laughs> yeah, no one will ever see it, but it's fine because I get the impression count. I don't care what the IAB has to say, right? So now right. everyone's finally... Uh, you know, aligned for the most part in terms of what they're looking to accomplish. And I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for clients who have doubled down on owning their audience, having a good first party data strategy and preserving the relationships of, of those that they, they have in their database. Yeah. And it's all about right now, especially in the B2B sp space, relationships. It's about building those relationships because as a publisher or any company, if you don't take the time to really nurture those relationships, you'll grab them and then you'll lose them. You'll grab them and then you'll lose them. And that is just an exhausting way to run a business where take the time. It does take time to build those relationships, to really understand the other people. But when you do that, you'll build a relationship that instills trust. And you know, if you, you build up that trust, if they need any information on what your publication has, they're going to go to you. Right. We we all have our favorite sites for yes. that that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> like there, there are spots we all start our day with, you know, whether it's like our own like personal interests, whether it's news, whether it's sports, whether yeah. it's weather. Absolutely. But I, I think in a lot of cases, particularly with in B2B, you really only get one chance to to make that mistake and lose their trust, though. And, you know, it's a very much a long term relationship you need these readers, you need this audience for the long haul. I mean, I think as opposed to selling widgets where you're moving them through a funnel one time and, yeah. you know, in this case, you have a key audience member who is being monetized 
consistently, even daily uh, to an extent, either through directly through subscriptions, through advertising, through both um, when, when you're selling them event tickets. Uh, so, I mean, to, to lose that person, that's really expensive. And I think particularly in some cases, I mean, to your point, like, oh, you have to keep rewinning that same person. That's a, a recipe for disaster because that's going to get really expensive. But particularly in B2B media, there's a limit on how many of these people exist. And, yes. you know, I use the same example all the time. But when I was on the publishing side, there was one fleet manager at McDonald's. And mm -hmm. as soon as she opted out, we lost her. And yeah. there's not a replacement name coming in right behind that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure, especially on the high end of, of this, uh, you have to be very cautious and deliberate in terms of how you're working with these people, because if they decide that they're done with you, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, and definitely not inexpensive to, to win them back. Yes. Yes. And that's, you got to do the trust, but it also, you have to do your due diligence on the front end and a platform like Omida, I feel helps publishers with that. It helps them identify activity. It helps them identify certain people, what they're looking for, but it also helps you realize what content of yours is really responsive. What are they interested in? Or even on, on what type of a channel, do they like the webinars or do they maybe like your podcast better? You know, all that information that you can gather from that platform is so useful in helping companies grow continuously year after year. I think there's a big opportunity because as much as we like to think that engagement is binary, whether, you know, where all of a sudden one day they just fall off, it typically goes through a little bit more of a phase, right? So yes. our publishers who are really seeing success are introducing some of these re-engagement efforts much yes. earlier in the process. They're not waiting until 12 months has passed since this person came to their website or opened or clicked on an email. They're <laughs> starting to see some of those signals, in some cases through direct actions, in other cases using more of like the data science pieces that we have uh, inherently built into the platform to say, hey, like we think this person's a churn risk or they've recently become engaged, something like that they're building those into the marketing automation voyages saying, okay, this person has opened less than X number of emails in the last uh, however many days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Now let's put them through a little bit more of a soft touch where it's not that like begging kind of approach, like, please come back. We just need you to click this email one time and we'll start bombarding you again. They're able to go back through and with a, a lot more nuance, kind of bring them back in without it having to be such a, a violent um, uh, kind of motion to bring them back into their active data. Yeah. And I think that gets people's backs up right away. If one you're like bombarding them or you're just, if you're always just asking them for information, like, okay, give me your email. Now tell me your title. Now do me this. No, you've got to offer value. You've got to offer, just like why we're doing this podcast, education. You've got to put content or videos, whatever out there that just help educate people, help them do their job. Just be nice. <laughs> <laughs> some, some real business resources are, 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 of course, always appreciated. And I think, you know, even the, your readers, whether it's on the consumer yeah. side of things or on the B2B side of things, they're a lot, they become a lot, uh, more cognizant of what you kind of can't do in yeah. space. Right. And we saw with a lot of these privacy laws, going back to like GDPR and CCPA, I think those were the first times that people really noticed what was going on in the space and started to realize like, oh, there are limits in terms of what yeah. information I can or should share. And I think people are, are you know, of, of varying degrees, but are taking it a little more deliberately in terms of how they interact with different websites, where instead of they get the pop-up saying, we're going to collect cookies, instead of always hitting collect, uh, accept all, People are starting to read that and start to yes. starting to consider, just like we're seeing on the browser side of things with like the emergence of like DuckDuckGo on the browser mm -hmm. side and some of these other services that are a little more privacy um, by nature. Uh, you know, it's, it's evolving a little bit more. And I think as it's definitely happening in the consumer side of things, I'm way more concerned with my personal address or birthday getting out there than I am about my like work email address or my job title like so yeah. but i think as that bridges over from consumer into b2b um we're, we're going to see a lot more just um hesitation 
and uh, deliberate actions on behalf of both the audience members themselves, as well as the publishers that are trying to uh, collect that data. Yeah. Well, you're getting hit on so many different areas. You know, it used to be, okay, we had mail, just direct mail, but now you've got email and then it's coming in via text. And it's, you know, you have people contacting you on LinkedIn with sales messages and it just, there's days where I just sit there all day long, take me off your list, take me off your list, unsubscribe, you know, like just stop because I never subscribed. I'm not interested in what you have to offer. And companies, I do think, have to do their due diligence and really make sure that the people they're sending messages to really want to get it and that they're in that space. Can you really help them? You know, like we said before, that whole big spray and pray thing. No, that is a surefire way <laughs> to, you know, just get yourself blacklisted. Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, I mean, and we see that obviously as a, a very high volume email sender, you know, we, with our, our clients are deploying about 7 billion emails per year at this point, mm -hmm. the concept of IP and domain health, super important, because mm -hmm. just like the, the relationship with the direct advertisers or the, the direct readers, you only get one chance, same thing on the ISP side of things, right? And that's why we spend a lot of time monitoring that, making sure our clients understand best practices, flagging it when we see like a potential block. Uh, and making sure that everybody understands as much as they can, just because it can take a long time to come back from some yes. of that. And it's not as easy yes. um, as just spinning up a new IP address or a domain. And we've had some clients even come to us and say, oh, I just got blacklist blacklisted with company XYZ. Can I send from you all instead? And it's like, well, let's let's oh. talk about what happened, you know, because we <laughs> obviously want to protect, even though the majority of our clients- You protect your reputation. Absolutely. You don't want to end up in one of those- uh, bad neighborhood um isp ranges with yeah. this and even though a lot of our uh, a lot of our clients do have dedicated ips and domains some yeah. are still in a pooled environment so we need to protect the overall ecosystem as opposed to uh you know letting uh, letting some of the uh, i'm trying to come up with a good the rolex watch sales people um <laughs> you know kind of come in and just start sending email out of the omita platform we we direct them somewhere else <laughs> You you go over here. <laughs> yes. So right now, would you say that that's one of the biggest challenges that publishers are having? Or what would you say right now is the biggest challenge that B2B publishers are having? I, I think one of them is just the, the predictability of everything. I think uh, what we've seen over the last three to four years is that no two years are created equal. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously going back to 2020, that was... Uh, hopefully a, a bit of a once in a generation kind of kind of occurrence, but yeah. we're still seeing print hanging on um, with, with some of our clients where, okay, it's not a growth area, but the slowdown has slowed way down. Um, and it's just a nice, profitable, predictable part of their business. Everything else, it's a lot more volatile with this. I think digital did really well last year. Mm -hmm. Then we saw a huge slowdown in digital across our, our clients uh, in Q1 and Q2 of this year. I think events are always really tough. So I, I think the predictability of all of this, particularly right now, I mean, as, as you said at the top, um, and I appreciate the plug for our, our uh, OX show, um, we have OX7 coming up next year, May 15, 16, 17 in Chicago. I'm talking to clients that you know used to bring five or six people. They're saying it might be more like two or three. We're just being cautious with our, our T&E budget as we reforecast based on some of these other factors too. So I, I think that long-term view into the business is definitely one of the biggest challenges. But I think there's also a lot of opportunity here too for the clients that have invested in their content, who are hiring journalists, who are investing in their audience and have that really great direct relationship with both their readers and their advertisers. Um, it gives me a lot to be excited about right now. As, as I've said to, to many of our clients, uh, both on and off the record, this is a, you know, if I wasn't doing this, I'd, I'd be starting a B2B uh, publishing company because I think there's there's so much upside going on right now. And I think with what we've seen on the on the privacy side of things, the 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 playing field has finally been leveled against Google and Facebook as far as digital advertising dollars, right? And everything we're seeing from the privacy side of things, everything around um, like the Apple NPP with iOS 15, what's coming in iOS 17 with third-party cookies, allegedly eventually going away with Google Chrome, all of that is gonna make it harder and harder for these third-party programmatic uh, companies to really take those digital advertising dollars and 
those advertisers are still going to need to make connections with with their target audience and they're going to turn even more into into b2b media and publishing yeah well you know my side of the business b2b publishers is where i like my clients to go for any of their advertising because we are able to really whittle down their list to get exactly to the people they need to the people are engaged they're opted in they're compliant but we're also now seeing they're engaged and what are they engaging with? And that information publishers are willing to give their advertisers to help them get the best results. Where if you go to larger, either a compiled list or a program, you do not get that information. And that's why it's so great. And I see B2B, you know, I know COVID was awful, but I really think it pushed us more towards quality versus quantity, because people had to stop and say, okay, we're not going to do the spray and pray. We're not going to, you know, bombard people everywhere. We got to build that relationship, which pushes them towards quality. And that's when they're going to grain those relationships, like we said, and build trust. And now I'm going to give you a plug and people, I do not get a kickback on this, but for any publisher don't cut back the people you bring to OX7. It's OX7, right? No, and, and let yes. me see why. Because <laughs> last year I went on the fence. I'm like, ah, I don't know. What am I going to get out of this? And when I left the show, the knowledge that I received, but the people, the Omita people, I was able to talk to about the intricate things I was trying to do with my publishing clients is by far the best advice I ever got leaving a trade show. Like I left with actionable tips. I left with one of your people calling me up saying, Donna, did you figure that out? I have never happen, had that happen with a trade show. So if you're thinking about going to OX7, don't cut back, send the whole team because the better your team is and the more knowledge they have, the more they're going to get out of the Omita platform, which is going to help you succeed faster and consistently year after year. So that's great. I no, I not I really getting a kickback. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, I mean, we we have a luckily we have a, a very talented marketing team and a, yeah. a ton of other groups that all get involved. Um, we love to point out the fact that we are not professional event producers, and we know we have a room full of professional ev event producers. So the bar is high on all this. So <laughs> just to even keep up with our clients in that in uh, that regard is a. Uh, uh, we're very honored for any sort of compliments along the way. But I mean, I think, you know, kind of taking this full circle to what you said at the top in terms of, all right, there are 9,000 MarTech companies out there. Yes. Like, why bother with like an industry specific one? I think, you know, that that's part of it, right? You know, we can go through the fact that there are relevant features and it integrates with like other industry specific things like CRMs and CMSs and things like that. We can talk about the compliance part. But I think what you really get with a lot of this is that sense of community, Right. Who are those connections? Who are the people facing those same exact problems? I think I, I think publishing as a whole and, and B2B specifically has done a really nice job in the last few years because even when there is direct competition, there is sharing of ideas, yes. there's sometimes sharing of employees. That that's not up to us. But you know, I, I think there is a really strong community and a really strong fabric of folks who, whether you've been doing this for a very long time or are fresh into the space. I think it's a very welcoming group. Um, and it's a, it's a community that we are, you know, that we as Omita, but me personally, uh, count ourselves very lucky to, uh, to be a part of. Yeah. I was surprised when I was at the show, how willing and how in detailed some publishers went to tell us what they've implemented. You know, no one was sitting there going, oh, this is my secret. We're going to grow and none of you are going to grow. No, they were all willing to really go into detail and help others. And I just really like that. And this goes back to my thing. Let's just be nice. <laughs> 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 let's, let's all help each other succeed because especially on the B2B side, and I feel this is the case with any company, all companies are unique. Even if you might say, Donna, well, you're a B2B marketing agency. There's tons of those out there. Well, yes, there's tons, but how many of them are 43 years old, women owned, who deal in the industrial space? You see, as you whittle it down, we're very unique and there's no one who we compete with. 
And I think a lot of those publishers realize that, and that's why they're willing to help and share their knowledge, which for me, helping smaller publishers has really helped me help them grow their audience. That's great. Yeah, it's it's an important connection point. So yeah, no, it's a it, it's a it's a great industry and great community to be a part of. Yeah. So now you quickly you mentioned iOS seventeen. How do you feel that's going to change for publishers about growing their audiences and monitoring their audiences? Yeah, I think, and and we have a, a decent amount of information on this uh, on our website at omita.com. Um, there, there's always a little bit of a a wait and see approach with some yes. of this because what we see in the public betas of these new uh, operating systems is not always what we get with the full production version. I know with um, iOS 15 two years ago, uh, all the talk was about um, Apple MPP and what it was going to do to open rates. And we all thought that it was going to greatly suppress them. Yes. And then it came out and it actually accelerated them. <laughs> On average, we're seeing about a, uh, we're seeing a 100% increase in terms of uh, open rate compared to what we used to see. So there is always a little bit of cautiousness in terms of what this is going to turn into. I think in, this is going to have a lot less impact. Um, you know, in iOS 17, for anyone who's not um, uh, familiar with it, they have this link tracking protection aspect that's coming out where really they the goal there is to strip out some of the personally identifying information um, that comes through as somebody clicks across. I think the big stuff to keep in mind here is it's not going to remove your UTM tags. There's a lot of stuff that it is not going to get rid of. So um, at least at face value as of right now. Um, so we'll have to see what it what it turns into as it comes out. But I don't think this is going to have the same kind of disruption that we saw two years ago with, with all of this. Um, I mean, I think the, the good news, again, with all this, and I, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but having that that quality connection around like the content and the audience is really going to make the difference with all of that. And adding or removing a little bit of additional tracking, uh, some additional metrics, it's not like those people are not going to get to your content. It's not like they're not going to be able to consume what they're looking for. They're still going to be able to connect with their advertisers. So this isn't going to put up any sort of wall and protect you from uh, from getting in touch with the people you need to. And especially if you just continue to put the quality content out there, quality channels, they will come. I know I feel I feel like I'm field of dreams with Kevin Costner. You know, <laughs> you put the good, but you will if you put good quality content out there, or you have great webinars with information that is of interest to them. They will come. They will find you, and they'll stay with you, especially if you deliver what you say you will. And that information helps them with challenges or problems they're having. Those people are going to stay. Yeah, 100%. So last question, because I thank you for your time today. What do you foresee as the future of audience growth and engagement in the media industry? Yeah, I think everyone is always going to be watching privacy. I think that is just the, that's going to be one of our cornerstones. That is not going to be a, a topic that starts to, to come and go a little bit more. And, you know, so I, I think that's something where people are going to have to pay attention. We're seeing more and more uh, folks get involved with some of the industry associations that keep track of some of this. We're seeing more certifications pop up on people's uh, job titles, things like that. Um, I think uh, our, our clients our advertisers are going to keep pushing into that publishing space a little bit more or that original content producer space. So I think that's going to continue. I think we're going to see it move, uh, move down market a little bit. I think we're going to see a little bit less of it happening via agencies in terms of, oh, we just hire like a third party service to write our content. You're going to see more in-house talent at our clients, advertisers. Uh, I think you're going to see that big push away from programmatic. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of how people are looking to uh, to connect and communicate with some of these people, I think there will always be a little bit of that uh, remarketing kind of aspect where, OK, mm -hmm. they already went to your site moving on. But I think somebody coming out and just saying, hey, I bet I can buy my entire audience without having to work with a single publisher. I think that part is going to go away. So I, I think that's going to have that positive impact. And I know I already mentioned it, but those advertisers coming away from Google and Facebook and instead going back directly into the, the pockets of, of uh, B2B publishers. I think that's going to be really strong. But mm -hmm. I think it continues to be uh, an optimistic opportunity for everyone. I think everyone's going to have to continue to be nimble. But I think owning your audience, having a simplified tech stack, 
having a clear understanding of your content strategy, your audience strategy, and making sure those different team members are all connected, making sure ad ops is talking to email, which is talking yeah. to sales, et cetera. Um, I think that internal communication is going to be really important. Um, and I, I think finally, the concept of everybody internally owning the audience as opposed to just the audience team is going to uh, continue to really um, uh, spread throughout a lot of these these organizations. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing that already turn. Like I said, when COVID hit, I really think everything started to switch from quality to quantity. I mean, <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> quantity to quality. And so you're seeing this with the publishers, but I'm seeing it with some of my clients. And a lot of my clients have very expensive offers. So, you know, we can't go to social posting and we really need to go to industry specific publishers for our advertising channels. And what I'm seeing the publishers do, just like you said, is they realize that they have such a valuable asset there and they're helping their advertisers create more of a cohesive strategy because a one-off of anything, you know, do a one-off email blast or do one banner. No, people, you can't build that relationship and it doesn't work anymore. So you need that cohesive strategy. And that's where I see a lot of B2B publishers now offering new advertising channels that will all just complement each other. And that's a home run. I think Absolutely. You know, that's because where you're going to see results. Up. There are other parts of your, your organization that can jump in, right? So now yes. instead of just deploying that email and kind of going through that process, now you're able to engage your, your internal marketing studio or yes. marketing services team, whatever you want to call it. Because what we, what we typically find is as these advertisers start buying these larger uh, integrated marketing packages, yes. they're realizing they need a lot of content. So either they're providing it internally or they are relying on the B2B publishers to okay. actually help with that part too. So it's exposing some additional budgets, it's opening up some different opportunities, and it's really ingraining them in, in the advertiser's workflow and lead gen process, as opposed to, like you said, the, the one-off banner ad in one newsletter one time, and they say, well, I didn't get any, any new conversions. <laughs> and it's like, well, let, let's make sure we align those expectations along the way too. So as always, I think the biggest opportunity for our client, for B2B publishers, is to be those industry experts, not just in terms of the markets and verticals that they represent, but also in, in a digital marketing and, and overall marketing landscape, going out and making sure they're able to educate their, their own clients in terms of what's going on, best practices, making some of those recommendations. Um, you know, it's, it's a good chance to, to kind of get back out on the forefront and get on the, get on the um, uh, aggressive side, the offensive side, again, as opposed to just waiting by the uh, waiting by the fax machine waiting waiting for that io to come through <laughs> you're right you're right i i was talking to a company yesterday um i haven't worked with them before and they're asking me they're like donna we're doing marketing and nothing has worked and i said well this is and i gave some recommendations of what i would do and they said okay we'd like to hire you as a consultant and i said well first of all i'm going to make it perfectly clear that you don't hire me and within the first month you're like oh my gosh look at all these sales we get i said it doesn't work like that but what we will do is we'll set up a nice strategy that takes time, but every initiative you put out there will build on it to build those relationships. And I sound like a broken record that instills the trust that keeps those customers with you year after year. Especially depending on the product and the purchase yeah. price. I mean, with a lot of this, they are buying something that has a, a three-year buying cycle and has to involve 15 or 20 or 50 people because yeah. it's going to cost $100,000 or a million yes. or $10 million. Like that's not something, and I always use the example from the Bobbitt side, you know, they're buying 300 cars at a time. Somebody doesn't just roll out of bed and say, what if we switch to Ford? I mean, that's you a mean, much wait. longer process. You don't mean, <laughs> I don't look at my phone and say, look at this Facebook app. That's it. Let's go. <laughs> Today's the day. <laughs> I mean, bye, I think about bye, how much time I spend like looking at running shoes before I actually buy them, right? You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. You must be like my husband. He does like three weeks of research before he buys his shoes or something. I'm like, just buy them. And at that point, I remember, oh, that's right. I don't go running. <laughs> but they looked good. <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs>
Well, Tony, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I know I got a lot out of this. I think my listeners will. And I wish you all the success at Omida and the OX7 show. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate it. I, I, I've not done one of these before, but this was a lot of fun. So I appreciate the opportunity and, and thank you for everything. You're a good partner in the space. So it means a lot to us. Great. Talk to you soon. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the B2B Marketing Excellence Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss our next episode. And in the meantime, if you'd like to talk to me, please feel free to send me an email to dpeterson at worldinnovators.com. Till next time, have a great day.